Hey, good afternoon, everyone. It's Tractor Man 44 here. Uh, today we begin, begin part two. So now it's down to axle selection. Got this one here. I picked up over to much older brother's house. It's a an old 50s mobile home axle. I'm probably going to eliminate some of the springs because it's got at least 4,000 pound springs under it. It's got a stack of seven leaves under it. And I'm going to take off for every other leaf to shorten the stack, you know, by probably an inch and a quarter, inch and a half. Of course, they had to buy me some new shackles and everything like that. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go about the process of getting this thing straightened up and ready to go. I've got the center line marked here, but I've got to cut off a certain amount so that you can uh, put them together. Now, a thing to remember, if you're cutting off axle tubes, first off, you want to reinforce it by putting another tube on the inside of it whenever you, because you don't want just the butt weld. But the other thing, too, is that all your axles have a crown, and they'll always have a crown going up. So right now, this axle is crowned down because I've got it upside down here. But you want to mark your axle tube the full length or at least across the area you're going to cut out so that whenever you cut out 12, 14, whatever section you're going to cut out, you can match the two portions back together and align those marks so that you keep whatever's left of the natural bow uh, in the correct location, and that's in the middle. We gotta go back to business of marking the center line of this thing right here. And I'll tell you what we do when we do that. The spring perch is a reference to the crown in the axle. Just take your level and put it across your spring perch. It's doggone close to level right there. So these spring perches being level, we can now mark center line right through here, cut it off and then rematch the center line of whatever crown's left will be in the shortened axle. Now, you know, I told you this is all being built out of uh, salvage material. You find yourself in a situation where you have springs that are just way too high a capacity for what it is that we're going to be uh, hauling on this. This little bandsaw really has very little weight at all. Uh, even compared to the frame of the trailer that I'm building, the bandsaw is very minimal as far as total weight is, or it's probably less than half the total amount of weight. So this stack of springs is totally not required at all. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna restack this spring with a few less springs for two reasons. Number one, we do not need the capacity. And then number two, we don't want it uh, setting that high. We want to set it as low as we possibly can for comfort or for ease of operation. Discard this one and go with this one. Discard this one. Discard this one and go to this one. You know what we're gonna do? We're just gonna say to heck with it. We're going to abandon that one too. There's not that much weight here, so I ain't got much to be concerned about. So now we've greatly really reduced the capacity of the set of springs, but we've also reduced the height of the trailer by this much right now, here. Whenever I said I ground this head down just a little bit, that's got to be round in order for that to set down in there. This little thing right here is called the spring perch. That's because that's welded to the axle in a fixed position. This actually sits right on top of there and that, that hole in the spring perch with the mounting pin on the or assembly pin on the springs keep that from slipping or sliding out from under. That combined with the the plate that goes on here and the U-bolts holds everything in place. I'm just trying to square the springs and the axles up with the frame so that I can mark center line down through here so I can cut these off again to match these two up dead center or re-weld. And there'll be a little bit of adjusting here and there, but you got a rough idea of what we're going for. Once I get the center established, cut these both again to where they're dead center. And you can see, well, I don't know if you can see it, but I've got the center line marked all the way across to where I know exactly how to match these guys back up. Okay, I got both axle stubs cut to the correct length. Uh, you can see the Schedule 80 pipe, the wall thickness is extremely thick as compared to what the new ones are. The new tubings are very, very thin by comparison. What I'm going to do, instead of having a, a butt weld, I'm going to camfer this down, you know, put a, a, an angle on it so that I can fill that all the way up with a weld. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to slip this piece of inch and a half pipe inside and then the other one over the top before you know before this gets welded. And what I'll do is I'll weld buttons on this in three places to where I can slide this in and then it'll be nice and tight in there and reasonably close to center. Then what we're going to do is we're going to drill, it doesn't matter, but I'm gonna drill, try 120 degrees apart, three holes on this axle stub and on the other axle stub over here. 
and then once this is welded in place then I'll weld those holes shut and what that'll do is that's going to create a situation to where this piece inside here will be working against the axle out here so that there will be literally no potential no chance for extreme flex but I'm going to do that just so that we don't have nothing but a butt weld right here in the middle. We're gonna be using this old Delta drill press. This came out of the local Chrysler plant 30 or 40 years ago or so and been laying in a guy's basement. I got it from him, oh, I don't know, a couple of years ago through my, my son-in-law. And it was a three phase originally. There's a lot of youngsters here that probably don't even uh, understand how these works without a chuck. But this is what they call a number two taper. If you take a look at your drill bit right here, you can see there's an angle on this right here, which happens to be a number two Morse taper. And there's a little slot right here and you can see a slot right there. Well, this will slide right up in and lodge in place when you put pressure on it. That forces it up in there and friction holds it in place. This is really a, an, an awesome old machine. It's been dropped. You can see the brazing on the cast back here, so it's been abused. You can actually see how you can adjust the head all the way up. It's got a crank here and it's got a flat drive gear right here. You can turn that crank and you can raise this thumb all the way up to the top of that post to where you can get a really monstrous throat. The work table is massive. It's, uh, oh Lord. It's, uh, yeah, it's roughly 24 inches square, and uh, you don't adjust it like you do a normal drill press at home. Uh, this here's got the big old Acme threaded gear that you actually rotate this in order to thread it up and down to adjust the height of your work table. Now, this portion of it right here is a Swiss-made rotary table. That did not come with the machine. Now, that's got a whole other story to it, but uh, that's a good place to store it because it's so massively heavy. I don't like to move it around unless I have to, but this is the actual work portion right here. And as you can see, it's got a big old tray all the way around where if you're using lubricant, you can drain that back into a pump or into a sump and pump it back up while you're drilling. Okay guys, see how nice and tight this is? This thing is in there good and tight. It won't fall out for hardly anything at all. Now's the time to pick up this little fella right here this little wedge, stick it in the hole the correct way, <laughs> and take your hammer, and out comes your bit. Just that easy. Okay guys, now let me tell you something. When you go to butt weld a Schedule 80 axle, or a Schedule 80 pipe of any kind, you don't just make those surfaces up like this and just butt weld them and allow whatever penetration you get. You'd never do that. What you want to do is you want to bevel those down. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and bevel the end of both of these axle halves so that when I made them up, it, I'll get a full penetration of that bead all the way around the uh, the perimeter. So as I always say, do not do the things I do. There'll probably be some people holler about this, but uh, you know, I don't have a machine to, to turn everything. So I just got the spindle chucked up in the, in the vise and I'll be able to rotate this by hand and then hold the grinder over here. Uh, don't do that, trust me. You don't want to do that yourself. What I've got is a 9 inch disc on a 15 amp grinder. Uh, it weighs about 14 pounds or so. Uh, it's kind of hard to do unless you've got a real good grip on it. But you get a good bevel on it and everything works well. So like I said, don't do the things I do. And if you notice, when this thing is rotating around, you can actually see it going elliptical. And if you notice, here's my little crack mark right here that I put. That's the, uh, the very top of this axle, which is the center line of the spring mount. That's because I still have a little bit of that hump or that little bit of that uh, bow left in this axle even though we cut so much out of it in order to shorten it down. So by having this perfectly straight up, we're going to maintain that little bit of a crown in the center of that axle. See how it wants to go around in elliptical? It's not bent, that's that natural crown. You know, I always say the only thing better than cutting wood on a 95 degree Fahrenheit or 35, 36 degree Celsius day is being involved in a welding project. Now, if you take a look at this, no, it's not perfect. Not perfect by any stretch of imagination. But if you uh, remember, remember the, the six button holes I drilled into here? Well, I stuffed that uh, inch and a half piece of pipe in, centered it up, and welded those button holes shut with the pipe clamp on, pulling this thing through to my groove. You can see my groove that I got here marking the very top of the axle. So I welded those together because what that's going to do 
with those secured before you start welding this is to make sure that the heat's not going to warp the axle like this with it welding it welded in those six places. Uh, but prior to doing that, I held everything square and true and tacked three tack marks of roughly 120 degrees apart on this to hold the plane the way it needed to be uh, held in relation to one another. Then welded these six, then went about the business of, of welding a portion of it at a time, peening it and letting it cool in between to minimize the chance of over temp and heating and causing this to warp as it cools down. It's still fairly hot right now, but you can see it doesn't look too awfully bad. And I went ahead and buffed that up a little bit just because it, it'll make it look a little nicer. So now we're going to go back to business of finding the location to put that on this trailer. Had this been a, a trailer frame for a, a trailer that's actually going to haul loads, there's a technique that I used to locate the axle based on the uh, the center dimension of the trailer and then addings to it. For instance, this whole thing is 21.4 inches long. Okay, so what you do is find the center point, half of 21.4, 10 and a half plus 2 inches, which is 10 foot and eight inches. But what I've done, I went ahead and measured out that center line right here on the uh, on the bottom of the trailer frame. Now what I usually do, like I said, if this is a material hauling trailer, add 12 inches to that center, to that center line right here, and then add one inch for every deck length of the trailer. You know, like if you have a flat deck over trailer or whatever, you add one inch for each one of them. So this being 21 feet, I would add 21 inches to it. 21 inches would put us all the way back here. That becomes the center line for the single axle in this case. If it was a two axle trailer, that'd be the center between the axles. Or if it was a three axle trailer, the center axle would go right at this point. It's a rule of thumb, it's what I use. I don't know if it just works out good for proportions of load. This particular trailer is not gonna be a load carrying trailer. So I'm not gonna use that particular formula. But what I am going to do is place it just a little bit to the rear of the center point, which is way up here, but I'm going to put it right about here. And the reason being is because I've got my reinforcement channel irons here. And if there is a, lo a little bit of a flex in those springs going over a little rough terrain, I don't want the springs to bottom the axle out on these. So what's going to happen is the, the leading eye is going to be over here. And then the arch of the spring is going to go over the top. The axle is going to be about here then the arch of the spring will go back down to about here. So that's what the plan is. I'm shooting for somewhere around in this area. And if you look, it's actually uh, only eight inches off from the regular calculation for a trailer. But this will give us a proportional amount behind the axle for whenever you turn. If you have too much back behind the axle whenever you turn, the back end wants to sweep. And if you have the axle too far to the rear, then your turning radius is so monstrously, monstrously huge, especially with a four wheel drive, long wheel base, eight foot bedded truck, you know, out, you know, in a tight spot. It makes that much more difficult. So that's where we're at right now. So I'm gonna go fiddle with placements of the shackle mounts right now. Well, I got what I consider to be the location for the axle and I've got it tacked in place. But instead of welding the shackle mounts directly to the bar joist, which I didn't really want to do, I went ahead and put these shackle plates underneath there. Those in turn will be welded to the outside of the actual bar joist themselves instead of across the face of the bar joist, possibly giving a little bit of a weakness to those uh, to that surface. We're going to skip weld down the sides of both of them. I've got one tire on it. I've got one on just to verify that everything's going to clear, everything's going to be fine. And if you take a look, I don't know if you know much about shackles. I don't know a whole lot about them, but I know that they don't go straight up and down. They typically want to be lead just a little bit to the rear of your 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 uh, shackle mount, simply because the weight of whatever's on the trailer will go ahead and allow this to pivot down here, uh, and then the springs will be working at the same time, straightening out and flexing back, straightening out and flexing back. You don't want an exaggerated angle on this because if you have too much of an angle on it, before the spring stretches too far or gives much bounce, these will pop all the way down to here and that give you a bad day because then it's gonna make your trailer go all wonky and everything, you know. 
So there's a there's a, a specific angle that you need to have those. I don't ever use a specific angle. I just put a slight tilt to the rear and I've been lucky so far. And this is going to draw part two to a close. I've got it just about where I need to get it. Part three is going to be permanently attaching the axle and finishing up the front end, putting a tongue on it, tongue and draw bar and, and boxing out the front end of the trailer. Whenever we get done with that, then we'll get this in a secure location permanently welded in place. That should be part three. I think it's looking pretty good. This is Tractor Man 44 and guys, I am out of here.